All right, well, open your Bibles anywhere because we're going to be everywhere. <laughs> um, what we like to do uh, usually at LifePoint is we like to study books of the Bible, uh, essentially verse by verse. Every week we come together, we want to do three simple things, read the text, explore the text, apply the text. What does the Word of God say? What does it mean? And why does it matter? And, uh, and, and sometimes, usually during the summer and during Advent, we'll take a break and we'll do a sermon series. So we uh, opted to do an apologetic series this year uh, that is defending the faith. We call it always ready. How can we be ready, as it says in First Peter, to give an answer for the hope that we have? To give a, we want to give a defense of, of our faith and the things we believe and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so what we did is we actually put a survey out to you, our church family, both campuses, had over 100 responses. And basically the question was, what do you, what are you struggling with as it, as it pertains to uh, reaching, the, reaching the lost around you or those uh, kind of apologetic kind of conversations that you might have? And so from that, then we framed the, the, the series. Last week, we uh, answered the question, why are Christians so hateful? And we talked about a a biblical sexual ethic would encourage you if you haven't um, been a part of it. You can always go online to our YouTube, uh, Life Point Church League City, and it'll pop up, and you can always catch up to wherever we are. And today we're going to ask the question: Was well, Jesus really God? And then next week we are going to answer the question: If God is real, why is there so much suffering? So these are all just great questions. Great questions, and uh, and it's going to be very good. So I would encourage you next week. Uh, Many uh, people who don't believe in God, they struggle with that. That's usually actually the primary thing. Well, if God is so good and so loving, why does he allow uh, such evil to exist? Great question. Invite people to come and to hear, hopefully, a compelling answer in a gospel presentation. But uh, I want to share something with you before jumping into the subject that sometimes, sometimes God gives you a little bit of insight, a little bit of understanding and wisdom. And I'm not sure who this is for, but I wanted to share it as kind of an introduction into the text. So as all good encounters with the Lord begin, a couple of days ago, I was putting together Ikea furniture. And, um, you know, the scriptures say that God draws near to the suffering and the oppressed. And so uh, there, there I was. And uh, I'm the kind of guy that usually will not be insulted by using instructions. Uh, not, not really necessary. And I felt like God always confirmed this with me because he would miraculously, almost without exception, always provide extra parts and pieces at the end of the project. And I thought... What, what, a, what an amazing blessing. But I did something different this time. I thought, I'm going to meticulously follow these instructions, which really means just like stay with the pictures. It's all pictures. Uh, and so I did that. And, and what I found as I worked my way through the project is I had to actually undo and redo less and less as I made my way through. And then it got to the point actually at the very end where I actually didn't even need the instructions at all because I had the instructions memorized for exactly what I needed to do for the next step. You could have thrown me into an Ikea pit stop. Uh, I was throwing Ikea chairs together four minutes flat. I mean, I was record timing. It was so good. But here's what I was thinking as I was doing that. I feel like so many, so many people like to live life or try to live life apart from the instruction manual, which is God's word, apart from meticulously uh, and patiently working through the instructions that God has given us as to what we ought to believe, how we ought to think, um, how we ought to behave, and, and instead try to go at ourself. And, if you, and when you do that, you will find, if, if you would pay attention to the, God's word, you'll find that you'll make less mistakes along the way. You'll have to undo and re, have to redo less things in your, uh, in your life that... Um, it will be easier to build your, your life. And so uh, you'll even get to the place where, as David says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, that you actually know how to walk through li many situations in life and decisions in life without actually having to go back through because the word of God is hidden in you. And so I just wanted to start with that because there's really no better place to start than with the subject of who is God, actually knowing and understanding who God is and how he's revealed himself in the word. Many people in our world will give you all kinds of opinions on what they think God is or the, 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 the big you or the whatever they want to call it. Uh, but the thing is, how is that how is that revelation determined? Now, it's, it's very likely we, we maybe misplaced the order because in a few weeks we'll do uh, how can I trust the Bible or know that the Bible is reliable. Maybe that would have been helpful to preempt this conversation because we're going to look into what does the Bible say about who God is. 
Uh, but let's just, let's just take it for granted for today's sake and say, okay, this is God's word to us. Now, how do we understand how God has revealed himself to us? And how do we specifically understand who Jesus is uh, in, in all that? And so we're going to start by, by this, recognizing this. We are what's called Trinitarians. Uh, we believe in the Trinity. Think of it maybe as like a tri-unity. There is one God that eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons. One God, three persons. In all of the persons of the Godhead, as we would say, are equally God. They're different in role and function, but they are equal in their nature, in their Godness. None of them are more God than the other. So there is one God that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we're going to sift through that specifically today, saying, well, how do you get to that kind of a weird ideology or theology, rather, um, from the text? And, and we'll get there. Now, the deity of Christ, it's, it's one of the most important and most attacked beliefs that we hold as Christians. Our belief that Jesus is God is the most significant difference that we have with basically any other religion and specifically other Christian religions. We're the only ones that believe that Jesus is, in fact, God, or we'll say the full understanding of the, of the Trinity. These other Christian cults, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Christian science, uh, they all deny us everybody else. Interestingly enough, we agree with the Catholics on this. We don't agree with the Catholics on like a ton, uh, but the deity of Christ, we're in lockstep with them. So praise God for unity on that. But throughout church history, this has been a hot topic, very debated, a lot of division because many have sought to undermine the deity of Christ. And when I say deity of Christ, deity means like godness or, or God, right? So the godness of Christ. So that has serious uh, implications dealing with the very essence of who God is, like who he is in his very nature. And our worship flows, how we worship actually changes based on our understanding of who God is and who Jesus is. Because if Jesus is not God, then that means he is not eternal. And if he's not eternal, that means he began to exist at some time. He was created. You don't worship created beings. You only worship God. You see how there's a, there's a direct connection to how our worship flows. We're singing the name of Jesus from stage. Why are we doing that? So let's start by looking into the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in short, uh, this is kind of the, the overarching uh, important theme, that there is one God and he alone is to be worshipped. There is one God and he alone is to be worshipped. Deuteronomy 4.35. To you is shown that you might know that the Lord is God. There is no other besides him. Deuteronomy 4.39. Know therefore today and lay it, uh, lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath. There is no other. The first two commandments in Exodus 20 of the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord your God uh, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And by the way, uh, interesting this language, which we'll talk about in a second, but um, wait, it just said there, is, there are no other gods. So how is he saying don't worship other gods? Um, the fact that there are no other real gods that exist does not prohibit something, um, uh, humanity, mankind, determining that something is a god and worshiping it. Does that, does that follow? So he's saying you don't do it. You don't do it. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is heaven above or that is on earth beneath or that is in the water or under the earth. You shall not bow down to serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. In Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your might. There is one God and you are to love in this one God with all that you are. This is known as the Shema. And for faithful Jews, they would still do recite it twice a day. And what it is is a constant reminder that there is one God and he alone is to be worshipped. There is no other. And this is, what made the, this is what made the Israelites, by the way, so different from all of the other surrounding nations. They would have been known, what's called as... Um, 
uh, polytheists, poly being many, theists being God, many gods. They believe in all kinds of gods. And we know this with like, um, uh, you know, they would have the God of fertility or the God, the sun God, the God of the harvest. The God, there were gods for everything. But the Israelites were monotheists, mono being one God. They worship this one God alone. It's a fundamental aspect of being a Jew. There are no other gods. He is the Lord Almighty. He alone is to be worshipped. And to abandon him, abandon him in worshiping other gods is to then bring judgment on themselves, which happened. But faithfulness would bring blessings upon them. Right? So this is like, this is like um, it, like the main pillar in all of the Israelite Old Testament belief. One God. One God and he alone is to be worshipped. So then there's some problems then because Jesus comes on the scene in the New Testament and he starts saying things that, that really uh, is tough to reconcile in light of what we understand in the Old Testament. So first we want to look at, well, what did Jesus say about himself? And then what did other people say about Jesus in, like to affirm and understand what he was saying? Like, did, are they saying the same thing that he was saying? And, and you can determine so you might often hear that uh, someone say that Jesus never actually said the words, I am God, and that's actually true. He never used those precise words. However, it doesn't mean that he didn't claim to be God in many ways, word and deed, and we're going to explore some of those right now. All right, first we're going to look in John 8, 56 to 59. Jesus is uh, talking to the religious leaders. He says this, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. Remember Abraham, thousands of years before, God calls Abraham into relationship with himself. Um, and, and then from there, kind of the Israelite nation begins. But again, where this is just time frame, uh, if you're not too familiar, we're talking thousands of years uh, before. Uh, he saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you're not yet 50 years old and you have seen, have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. So they pick, the religious leaders pick up stones to throw at, Je, uh, at Jesus. In Levit Leviticus 25, the punishment for blasphemy uh, is stoning. So they're picking up stones to kill him for blasphemy. And we go, well, what about what he said was blasphemous before Abraham was I am? Why is that, like, why is that so bad? Well, if you remember, uh, once the Israelite nation was established, they were taken captive into uh, some land that you may know of called Egypt, and they were there for 400 years. And then God shows up in a burning bush to a guy named who? Moses, that's right. Uh, and... And so he calls Moses out and he says, I'm going to send you to rescue my people. You're going to go to Pharaoh. You're going to rescue and bring my people out of Egypt. And this is Moses' response to, uh, to the Lord. Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said, and he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you to me. You see, they pick up stones to stone Jesus for blasphemy because he says, before Abraham was, I am. The exact phrase, ego me" in the Greek that was used in the Old Testament here. Blasphemy. There is one God and you give yourself his name? So John 10 31 through 33, we see another example. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. And the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? Because oftentimes uh, the way you validate the message and being a messenger from God is you will perform many good works or miracles. And this is what they say. The Jews answer him, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you for blasphemy because you, being a mere man, make yourself God. It seemed to be very clear. 
I was uh, debating Jehovah's Witness. Anytime they come to the door, I usually like to uh, a knock. You want to talk about being always ready. I can tell you, when you get that knock on the door, they are always ready for you, though you may not be quite ready for them. I would encourage you to uh, engage those conversations lovingly and with patience and kindness. Now, uh, I showed them this text. Uh, I showed a guy this text one time, and I said, it seems to be pretty clear. You a mere man, you a mere man claiming to be God. And his take on it was really interesting. He said, well, yes, that's what it says. But so they mistakenly believed that he was claiming to be God. So they picked up stones to throw him. So Jesus wasn't actually trying to claim to be God. They just misunderstood it. And I was like, whoa, okay. So I was thinking like two reasons that's kind of off base. Number one, that would mean that Jesus, the one sent by God into the world, was not a very clear teacher. If he would leave that much room for misunderstanding and allow it to stand, it's not a very good teacher. And the second thing is this, if the Holy Spirit inspires the writers of scripture to write it, why would they leave such confusion? It's like, maybe the reason they picked up stones to stone him is because they understood exactly what he was trying to do, which is what the text says that he was trying to do, right? Weird. So anyways, so, so then uh, those are just a few examples of here, here's what Jesus uh, says about himself. And it's worthy of note that these aren't just a few random proof texts. It's like these texts are all over the scriptures. From Genesis to Revelation, uh, we can see this consistent pattern of God as one and God as three persons. Uh, And even in the gospel accounts, the gospel of John usually is the one that talks about Jesus as deity, Jesus as the Uh, as God. And that's because each of the four gospel writers had a little bit different of an angle or audience. Uh, And as we've been, for example, been preaching through the gospel of Matthew, Matthew's purpose to Jewish audience is to highlight that Jesus is the promised king from Israel. They're expecting a promised king, uh, bringing the kingdom of God. And so that was a whole theme, a whole narrative that they're expecting. So that's his angle. But even in the gospel of Matthew, we can still pick up pieces uh, of, um, of the deity of Christ coming out. But John is the one that's most potent about um, uh, focusing on Jesus is God specifically. Okay, so what did others then say about Jesus? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. That's just worthy of pause there so that we read it again. The word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word was with God, and the word was God. All right, okay. So how how do those two things coexist? How can you be with something and be that thing at the same time? So that's just one, one minor example of, okay, we start to grasp this idea of Trinity. One God, he was, was God, uh, that that exists eternally as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which then explains how he could be with God. By the way, um, our belief in, in the Trinity uh, uh, is not determined because it's fully and easily comprehended. Right, so we say we don't dismiss something because maybe it's hard to understand. The question is, does it seem to be true as it pertains to the text? Okay, continue on. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. This seems confusing, but actually what John's trying to do is exhaust the language. So he was with God, and he was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things that were created were created through him to such a degree that if that without him, nothing would have been created. And here's why that's important, because many... Anybody that believes Jesus existed and that Jesus is not God necessarily believes then that Jesus was created. He had a beginning. So the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, would would say, for example, uh, Jesus was the first creation and then all things came through him. Uh, But the language is too exhaustive, doesn't really leave room for that. It's an addition. We see this in Colossians 1.16. For by him all things were created in heaven and earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So like that kind of language doesn't leave room for a first created creator, if you're following me. It, it's not possible. But then, so, the, so then what ends up having to happen is they, uh, these are just some examples, sorry if I'm getting into the weeds, but like, um, so the Jehovah's Witnesses will add all other things 
All other things were created, and that's how they, they create a gap. In their older translations, they have a New World translation, and it's a trash translation. It's just so bad. Um, and uh, their, their handling of the Greek is atrocious. But in the older translations here, the other, all other things were created, actually was in brackets. And the reason you put things in brackets is because you let people know this, this, this wasn't there. I'm adding this to help help you have understanding of it, right? It, this is an, in, an external insertion. So they used to have brackets, all other things, just to help that. Well, now in the newer translations, they don't have the brackets anymore. They've removed the brackets, right? And so it's this slow fade of, of distorting God's word. And specifically, again, as it pertains to the deity of Jesus Christ. All right, and so Titus 2, 13, uh, he says, waiting for our, our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So these are just three different texts from three different authors that clearly understood precisely what Jesus was teaching about himself. And again, these aren't the only texts as we're going to get into um, kind of a cool, uh, a cool thing you can look up to if you want to be more equipped to understand, well, how do I give a defense for uh, the deity of Christ? So let me give you a, a little um, maybe a helpful tool. It's called the hands approach, H-A-N-D-S. And what we see throughout scripture is that Jesus shares all the same honors, attributes, names, deeds, and seats of God. He shares all of these things. Um, and, and again, this, is, this becomes difficult for, for the Jew that grew up uh, and was understood God is one and he doesn't share his glory and he doesn't share his power and he doesn't, like, he is the one true God, and there will be no other that he uh, that will replace him or be worshipped or any of those things. So then Jesus comes and it's like, whoa, okay, well, what's happening here? So honors. He shares the same honors. He is worshipped. Matthew 14, 33, Revelation 1, 17, uh, and others. Jesus is worshipped. We see in Hebrews 1, 6. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. He is worshipped. We see this in Thomas, uh, with Thomas, who says, uh, I won't believe that Jesus is resurrected until I see the holes in his hands and his pierced side. And so Jesus reveals himself to him and says, put your fingers here. You see the holes. You see my side. And what does Thomas do? He falls down and he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus does not rebuke him. Jesus tells him that he is blessed because he has believed he has believed. Uh, that he has seen and believed. And he says, blessed are those who have not seen and will believe. Uh, he receives worship as, as God. All right, attributes. Uh, Jesus is eternal, John 1, uh, 1 through 3 and eight fifty eight. Jesus is all-knowing, John 21, 17. Jesus is loving, Romans 8, 35 and 39. These are attributes of God. Jesus is given all authority, Matthew 28, 20. And Jesus came uh, and said to him, all authority all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he has the same attributes. He has, shares the same names as God. He is given the name that is above every name in Philippians 2. Jesus is called God in John 20, 28. Uh, he's called Lord in Acts 1, 24. He's called King of Kings in Revelation 19, 6. He's called Savior in Luke 2, 11. He is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, Revelation 1, 7 through 8. He's given the same names that are given to God. He does the same deeds that only God can do. Jesus said to be the creator in John 1, the sustainer of all things in Hebrews 1, the sovereign, the one that's sovereign over nature, Matthew 8. We see that he is the one that gives life according to uh, John 5, 21, and that he forgives sin according to Matthew 9. These are deeds that only God can do. And he sits on the same seats as God. He is the ruler over all things, according to Revelation 5, that he sits in the judgment seat, 2 Corinthians 5, and that he will uh, sits on the throne of God, Revelation 3, 21. And so what we see is that to this Jesus, we know that one day, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. He has ascribed all of the worship, all of the attributes and names and deeds and seats of God in heaven. So there's some common confusions that come when we are talking about this idea of understanding that Jesus is God and the Trinity. So sometimes if you focus too much on the distinction between them, you can end up with what's known as like a tritheism, that it's basically three gods, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that they're not all one God, but they're actually three different 
different gods. You also have uh, one that's called modalism. When you focus too much on their unity, then you can come uh, with this belief of that there's actually one God who puts on different masks. It's the Father who then now becomes the Son and does the Son things and then becomes the Holy Spirit and is doing the Spirit things. But they don't all exist together at the same time. They, uh, they exist differently. Uh, by the way, this is where like some analogies I know are aim to be helpful and are mildly, but they always will fall short at some point. So you hear like water, H2O. Well, God's like water. You have ice and you have uh, liquid and you have steam. And these are three different versions or three different uh, um, modes or there's a word I'm looking for, but states. Thank you, sir. Um, three different states, but they are all H2O. And that's great. It's kind of a helpful analogy. The problem is they can't all coexist in the same environments, right? The ice and the steam, they can't coexist in the same environment. So there's just limits on them, even though they are kind of uh, mild, mildly uh, helpful. Um, the, the one that I, that I found helpful was uh, uh, Cerberus, which is a three-headed myth- mythological beast. It's one beast, but it actually has three, cent- three heads. So you have three centers of awareness, but it's not three beasts. It's like one beast. So you have like one living thing that has three centers of awareness, right? So one God that is three persons. But again, all, all of them come with their limitations. And then you have like monotheism that, that then denies the deity of Christ and then denies the deity of the Holy Spirit. So um, it can feel and get maybe a little complex, but the thing is what we're trying to do is, um, uh, well, I'll get there in a second. Let me give you a couple, a couple of other example, common rebuttals uh, that we face. So you see in Jesus' baptism, you have the Father and you have the Son and you have the Holy Spirit, right? The Son goes down into the water and he's baptized. And then the Father speaks from heaven and the dove descends. And so you'll hear someone uh, focusing on the distinctions and go, see, they can't be one God. It doesn't make sense. Who is, Je- who is the Father talking to? Like, who is Jesus talking to? Like, who's talking from heaven? If Jesus is God, then who's speaking? Very, very confused because they're, they're focused on the distinction and not understanding the unity. Usually people don't understand clearly the trinity, tri-unity. Uh, they they fa- find themselves kind of leaning towards one or the other. So we can affirm all the distinction passages. Yeah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit distinct persons. There's no problem for us. Or uh, where you see them, uh, where you see, well, there is only one God. We go, yeah, that's fine with us. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, no problem because our understanding of the Trinity. And then they'll say something slick like, yeah, but one plus one plus one doesn't equal one. It equals three. To which I'm like, yeah, but one times one times one times one equals one silly and not helpful <laughs> at all in the conversation, right? Uh, but nonetheless, this is how it goes. But even in the Jesus' baptisms, you see, they are told to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not names. It's not plural. It's singular. The name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You see in Colossians 1.15, as another example, that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, Firstborn, so proof text that say, look, firstborn, I mean, it doesn't get as plain as day. He's the firstborn among all creation. Therefore, in Colossians, uh, you know, 1.16, we're going to say, since he was the firstborn, all other things were then created through him. I understand the logic. It's just flawed. The question is like, well, what does firstborn mean? Does it mean only first in like timeline? Or does it have another meaning? Well, it actually does have another meaning. Uh, Abraham, when he has Isaac, Isaac is Abraham's firstborn son. The problem is he's not actually Abraham's firstborn son because Ishmael was Abraham's firstborn son. So we're talking about firstborn as in birth order. uh, That's wrong. So then, well, what's the meaning? Well, firstborn is a title. It's a status. They get the inheritance, right? It, it puts in a position in a seat that, that, is, that no one else has. So it's not first in order. It's first in position. Therefore, Jesus says the firstborn of all creation, that means that he is a status higher than all of creation because all of creation was created through him. So he is distinct as God the Son and is over and above all of creation, but is not firstborn as in was created first. And then that works well with the other texts that go, well, without him, nothing was made that had been made. It's like, okay, well, that can still stand. 
Because otherwise, then that becomes confusing if we say, well, he was first born because he was created first. You following me? All right, this is making perfect sense. But this is why we have to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. Scripture to interpret Scripture. We don't just take one proof text and say build our whole theology on it. We go, what does Scripture say across the whole? And if there seems to be a, a general pattern and then something seems to fall outside of that pattern, then we should ask, like, taking it at face value, are there other, are there other potential meanings? Then the other thing is, like, you shouldn't go around finding all kinds of he- secret hidden meanings in texts either. So that's why we do our theology in community, right, together. So we can be, call each other heretics when the time is appropriate. All right, what about John 3.16? Jesus is the only begotten son. See, he's begotten. He's begotten, which created, born. So if he's the only begotten son, then that makes sense. But again, is there another meaning for only begotten? We go, well, yeah, actually, it means one of a kind or special in relationship. Hebrews 11, 17, uh, Isaac is called Abraham's only begotten, but he's not actually his only begotten if we define it in that way because Abraham had other kids. It's a position. Jesus is in a unique, special position, and that is true. And what we want to do is we want to merge biblical texts together to build our theology This is why I think the creeds can actually be helpful because uh, there are men over long periods of time that have come together to wrestle through the scriptures and debate the merits and uh, and to try to form with exact, as exact language as possible, um, big overarching theological uh, beliefs and positions that the whole of scripture says, but in a, in a succinct kind of manner. So in 325, there was a council, a council of Nicaea, where they came together and they wrestled over this very topic. And it's interesting because the, the debate was all about, ha, had to do with just a couple of letters. Uh, I'll probably butcher it, but it was like uh, homoousa or homoousa or something like that. Basically, it's like, is he the same substance or is he like similar in substance. That's basically what. Is Jesus the same substance as God or like similar substance? And they like wrestled and they're like, not literally wrestled, uh, but uh, sometimes they do come to blows in those councils, by the way. Um, So anyways, uh, they'll excommunicate each other. It gets wild. It gets wild. And uh, and so they wrestle through and then they come up with a creed, which we understand as the Nicene Creed. Let Let me read this to you. It says this, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. Now, that's not easy to understand, but it is comprehensive because if we understand that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have existed together for all eternity, what we do see is that the Son proceeds from the Father. Uh, Someone would give an illustration like this. You have a Son, the Son, actual Son, like burning all of Texas right now, Son. And from that Son, always, always is preceding light. They just are, that's always together. Again, the, the analogies fall apart, but you see, the Father has eternally existed and the Son has always proceeded from the Father for all of eternity. One God, that is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I'm gonna wrap up with a, with a final text and then move into the, the close here. But Acts 20, 28, care, uh, Paul is admonishing the elders in Ephesus and he says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers of. Follow this to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Who is the he? Well, the he is God. And he obtained the church with his own blood. God obtained the church with his own blood. So we understand then, God died for the sins of the church. God the Son, that is as distinct from God the Father. It's important. This, our, our, I think God knows our hearts. And by the way, I don't, I don't ever think, I think God shows us grace 
when we are immature and we have developing, uh, a developing understanding of Christ. Where it becomes problematic is when we have uh, determined and denied the deity of Jesus Christ, right? There's grace, that there's, like, we don't know. Like, we're learning. There's so much, we're, we're all in progress. There's plenty of things that we don't understand. So God definitely looks, looks at, our, um, at our heart. But I don't even remember where I was going with that, but that's important. Take, take it for what it's worth. If you get to the point where you're denying the deity of Christ, that's a dangerous place to be. It's, her- it's heresy. It's heretical. It distinguishes the difference between people that are Christians and not Christians. I remember where I was going with it. It affects the way in which, for example, we pray. Because, because we understand that we have God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So we can pray to God. We also can, as we pray, we can thank Jesus for dying on the cross for our sin. We ought not to thank God the Father for dying on the cross for our sins because he didn't, nor did the Holy Spirit. We can think and pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit in our life, that he would empower us, the Spirit of Christ, to live through us, to help us overcome sin or troubles and trial, because it is the Spirit of God that is left with us to dwell with us. And the Spirit of uh, uh, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. When Jesus says, lo, lo, I'll be with you always till the end of the age, how is he with us? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father because his Spirit is with us. You follow me? So it changes actually the way in which we think and we pray uh, and we interact with God. And I, again, I, I said the, the caveat because I don't think we're punished by uh, accidentally praying the wrong thing in ignorance, right? But it does help us to be more accurate in our understanding of who God is, that we can engage with him and pray to him uh, and live out this life with a better understanding of who he is. So it is Jesus, God, the Son, the Son of God, um, who died for the sins of the world. And this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'll call the worship team up as we wrap up here. But when we really think about this, okay, God is one God, three persons. The Father creates through the Son by the Spirit. You see this in Genesis 1. The creation, the Father speaks the word, it's the word, it's Jesus, the Spirit is hovering over the water. So God creates all things. His creation, then male and female, a special creation, male and female, made in his image, unique, different above all else, made in his very image, male and female, he created them, relational, loving, and the two will, think about the design, it's so cool, the two, a husband and wife will marry, they will become one flesh, the two will become one flesh, and we think of God, one God that is a multiplicity, a unity that is a multiplicity, so cool, like, and then the one flesh bears children, and you've got loving relationship, like, it's just, it's so awesome, anyways, so the design of God then, um, we sinned against God. We rebelled against him. We rejected his good design. And we brought on us then the deserving just punishment that comes from rebellion. We're told, we're told in the scriptures that the wrath of God remains on us that have not believed. Anybody that has not believed, you know, you, you, don't, you don't go to hell and receive the judgment of God because you reject Jesus. We've all already rejected Jesus. We're not starting a neutral ground. The wrath of God is already there. And so being that God loves his creation so much, the Father sends the Son to take on flesh. The Word uh, took on flesh and dwelt among us, came to uh, 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 become fully man and fully God. He didn't lose his deity and his power. He just didn't use it. And so he dwells among us and he walks among the earth and he teaches and he, um, and he does miracles and does all these things so that knowing that the, the ultimate end is that the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God, is going to go to a cross and be killed by those he created and be killed by those that he is seeking to save, that by the shedding of his blood, they would be washed This matters so much more than if it was just some created angel. God creates this angel to become a sacrifice. Man, to do that takes away from the, the, the power of what happens on the cross. The Son of God, eternally existent, takes on our sins in himself. It's not relegated to anyone else. It cannot be relegated to anyone else. And that is powerful as we seek to worship and understand who this God is. This is why we sing his name. This is why we praise him. And it brings glory to the Father when we praise the Son. And the Spirit of God is pushing us and moving us to bring glory to the Son, that the Father would be glorified through 
the Son. It matters. All of it matters. Right theology matters. And so today we understand Jesus Christ is deserving of all of our worship. He is our Savior. And through him we've, we can be restored to our Heavenly Father. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for revealing yourself to us. And man, we don't understand all of it full and clear. But we see it in your word and we're doing our best. Thank you for your grace as we have limited understanding. And Jesus, we know that you know what it's like to grow and to become mature as it, as it says you grew in his wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. That's part of your taking on flesh. So you sympathize with us. We want to know what's true. We want to worship rightly. We don't want to deny the glory due to Jesus. We recognize it. We see it in the word. It seems clear. And so we worship you and we praise you, Jesus Christ, our Savior. We worship you and we praise you, Holy Spirit, that dwells in, uh, in us and lives among us and empowers us. And we praise you, uh, Father in heaven, for sending your Son, for, uh, for, for, um, for loving us and demonstrating your love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, your Son, Jesus, died for us, that we might have eternal life, be restored back to you, as your precious image bearers. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.